Well, I'm Richard Roby, and internal medicine is my specialty. I'm board certified in internal medicine, recertified in 2006. So we figure out how to use this here. And I have to put this little disclaimer in here. Basically, this is an this talk is for information purposes only, and you know, you're, don't don't try and use this to go self-diagnose yourself or treat yourself. And only you and your physician work together can make the proper uh, and come up with the proper treatment and uh, strategies for taking care of yourself. All right. Just a little bit about me. I finished uh, medical school in 1993 at K&M, did my residency at Scott White in 1996, and I uh, was in private practice for uh, three years, and as I mentioned, I worked as a, as a hospitalist at the VA, and then I was uh, in Clifton for a couple of years. All right. Whenever I got up and I started making rounds each, each morning when I was at the VA, I love to get the residents and medical students to try and make sure that they always saw the big picture. So I thought we'd start this topic out with trying to get the big picture, and that is, what does your colon actually do? Does anybody have any idea what the colon, why you have a colon, and what your colon really, what it does? It seems obvious, but it's kind of not. Does anybody have any ideas? A little bit about kind of normal colon anatomy, and I'll give you the answer here in just a second. Okay, for those of you who don't know, your colon starts in your right lower quadrant, which is right here. This is right down here. It basically comes up in the ascending colon, and then you have your transverse colon, and it goes down to the ascending colon, and then you have your rectum. All right, your appendix lies at the junction of where your small bowel interfaces with your colon. So where the small bowel ends, the colon starts, and there lies your appendix. When you're born, your colon is approximately two feet in length, but by the time you reach adulthood, it's about five feet in length. The cecum, which is this the ascending portion of the colon, is the largest diameter. And the, the, uh, the, uh, the left side of the colon, the ascending colon, which goes down to the rectum, is the narrowest portion. And that's important here, and we'll explain why here, why the body is built that way, or why the colon is built that way here in just a second. This is kind of an, this is an anatomical picture here, and this would be, oops, a second here. This is where, this is your cecum over here. This is where the small bowel right here comes in and hooks into the, uh, the colon. And this is your appendix right here. Go up here, this is the, the ascending colon, and then you have the transverse colon, and the descending colon. Now, your liver lives in proximity to this portion of the colon right here, and that's why they call this the hepatic flexure. Your spleen lives over here in this portion, or this, near this portion of the colon, and that's why they call it the splenic flexure. Now, let me go forward here just a minute. Let me, here. let me go back here. So what does the colon do? That's kind of the big, that's the big question for this morning or for this afternoon. And the answer is it's all about water. You mentioned that the colon absorbs things, and you're right. The primary thing it absorbs, the most important thing about the colon, is its ability to absorb water. And you say, why? Well, here's what happens. When you begin eating your lunch here this afternoon, the first thing that happens is your salivary glands, like your, the, uh, the uh, submandibular glands, and all these up here in the carotid salivary glands, begin secreting saliva. And even in your stomach, your stomach secretes a tremendous amount of fluid as well, primarily acid to help break down food. As all that food begins to get digested, it goes into the, into the small bowel. You also get a little bit of secretion there, but ultimately you begin the process of absorbing your nutrients, like your minerals, for example, iron, things like that, will all absorb in what we call the proximal small bowel, the very beginning of, of the small bowel, what they call the duodenum. And then finally, things like B12, for example, get absorbed in the end of the small bowel. But as you get on out further down into the bowel, you begin to get in the process of absorbing water. If you did not have, if you take, took a patient and took their colon out, they'd have diarrhea all the time. And eventually, for people who are unfortunate enough to have to have a portion of their colon or all their colon taken out, a lot of times they'll end up having diarrhea sometimes postoperatively for some time. And then the small bowel can begin to act a little bit like the colon remarkably. But the colon's job is to absorb water. So, on this slide right here, what I want to show you is what comes in right here through what they call the ileocecal valve, which is the valve that connects the small valve here to the colon. This is like a slurry of the material that comes through here. And as you go along the path of the colon, what happens is it begins to dry out the material there. And that's why you have a solid dominant. If you don't, then you end up having diarrhea. Okay. Now, I hope what I do at this point is kind of talk a little bit about what are some problems that someone like myself sees as a doctor this day in and day out. People walk in and say, hey, I've got this issue or that. And one of the things I thought we'd talk about is constipation. I get this, for example, when I was in Clifton, 
I would have people come in at least a couple of times a week saying, I'm constipated. And, you know, it's not just a knee-jerk solution, but, you know, you sit down and you take a history of medications and you go through a number of things. The interesting thing about it is, and I've got some slides and some, some food labels I'm going to show you all here, and I think you'll find this pretty interesting. A lot of times I'll ask people, I'll say, well, tell me about your diet. Do you eat much fiber? And I say, oh, yeah, I eat tons of fiber. Well, tell me exactly what it is you eat. And the more as I, as I start getting into their history, I find out, no, they really don't eat as much fiber as they think. And you'll see this here in just a second. But one of the principal causes of constipation i found is, is, is a lack of, of really a good, healthy diet, which means a lack of fiber. And, of course, you know you see ads on TV all the time. There's all kinds of fiber supplements you can buy. And if you don't like eating high fiber foods, those are ways in which you can get at it. Things like Metamucil, for example. But then there's, just to show you here, just for an educational standpoint, there's all kinds of things that like for someone like myself will be thinking about when someone comes in and they say, I'm constipated. For example, might they have hypothyroid? For example, low thyroid function. Your thyroid gland lives right up here at the base of your neck. And for whatever reason, if your thyroid gland begins to gradually fail or it doesn't make enough thyroid, one of the key symptoms of hypothyroidism, which means a low thyroid state, is constipation. The other thing we see, too, I look a lot at is medications. What kind of medications are problems? Grapamil, for example, I don't know if any of y'all have heard of that, but it's a blood pressure medicine. It's, it's, it's a calcium channel type, a calcium channel blocker type blood pressure medicine. And many years ago when I came out of residency, it was used a fair amount. Nowadays you don't see it used much unless there's some kind of deep cardiac problem that uh, needs to be treated with a drug like that. But calcium channel blockers, some of them, not all of them, will cause problems with constipation. Narcotics are a big problem, or any type of narcotic derivative. Any cholinergic drugs, you can buy some of these over the counter, for example, like antihistamines can do this. And of course, colon cancer could be a problem as well. All right. So the question comes up how much fiber is enough? How much fiber should you get in your diet? Well, kind of the, the recommended daily allowance right now is about 20 to 35 grams. And that's actually pretty easy to get. But certain types of foods, processed foods, for example, are notorious at not having very much fiber in them. Uh, as you'll see here in just a few minutes, fruits and vegetables are one of the best ways you can go, and high fiber cereals as well. All right, so as I said here, what are some easy ways to get the necessary fiber in my diet? Well, for me, to give you kind of an idea of what I do, when I get up in the morning, I usually have a bowl of oatmeal. And oatmeal is pretty good, as you'll see here, but it doesn't have really a lot of that much fiber in it. You, know, you read on the label, hey, it helps lower your cholesterol and things like that, and it probably does to a certain degree. But you have to supplement that a little bit. So I'll end up putting some other types of cereals in there, in which I'll show you in just a second. For supper, or like for lunch, one thing I've really enjoyed so far since I've been here a few days in the world is they have a, they serve a pretty healthy diet here at this cafeteria, which is remarkable. <coughs> because for some reason, a lot of hospital cafeterias, they, they serve some of the worst food in the world. It's extremely high salt. I remember my, when my dad was his heart a few years ago, he had a heart attack in another hospital. And I'd go downstairs, and all I'd see was pizza this and pizza that and junk food and hamburgers and they were frying these. And I, you know, I thought, this is great. I got my dad upstairs having a heart attack. <laughs> so anyway, and then the stuff they brought in, you couldn't eat it. It tastes like cardboard, you know. But for me, my favorite stuff, like for, for supper, I like to have something along the lines of like broccoli Normandy. It's a mixture of like carrots, cauliflower, um, uh, and also uh, broccoli as well, or carrots. Brussels sprouts, and then I love eating like fresh vegetables like peas, pinto beans. The problem is if you buy the canned foods like that, you've got to watch them because a lot of times they'll have an awful lot of salt in there. Yeah. All right. Now, this is one of my favorites. I love cornflakes, but I've had many patients come in and they'll say, hey, I eat cornflakes for breakfast or I'll eat Cheerios or something like that. And I'll say, well, how much fiber is it? Well, I don't know. So here's an example I want to just show you here. Look at this label here. One serving on this is one cup in size, okay? And if you go down to the bottom here, you'll notice one cup of this only has one gram of fiber in it. Now, I just told you I need around 20, you know, 30, 35 grams of fiber. That'll cut it. So, then we get on to something like oatmeal. And I'm not picking on these, but these were, you know, pretty common, uh, pretty common uh, forms of cereal. If you'll notice here, a half a cup here, for example, has, now we've got four grams of fiber. And the good part about this is, it has two grams of soluble fiber. Now, does anybody know what they mean when they talk about soluble fiber versus insoluble fiber? Does that ring, ring any bells with anybody? All right. 
Soluble means it's soluble in water, and that's real important. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good example here of how to explain this. But soluble fiber you'll read and see more often than not is the type of fiber that you want that helps lower your cholesterol. And the reason for this is the what they call the bile acid salts that are secreted from your liver are, are put at the very beginning of the small bowel. Agents like soluble fiber will bind to that and prevent them from being reabsorbed as that gets on down towards the end of the small bowel. Mm -hmm. Now, what soluble fiber is not real good at, typically, is bulking up your stools. Now, a lot of times when people come in and are planning a constipation or they're only going to the bathroom once a week, they need your stools to get somewhat bulked up. And that's where the insoluble fiber comes in and helps play and helps that out. But anyway, as you can see here, we're getting a little closer here. So if you took one cup of this, here you're looking at about 8 grams of dietary fiber, so that's getting a little bit better. Now, there's some other cereals. I just picked this one here, for example. This one here, at 3 quarters of a cup, it's pretty close to about like what oatmeal does, where you have about 5 grams of fiber. But then you get into this, like all brand. And I have recommended this to so many patients, and had them come back a few weeks later and say, hey, this is incredible how this helped me out. Look at this. This is one-third of a cup. And in here, you have 13 grams of fiber. So what I tell patients is when you go home and start eating this, don't go home and eat a cup of this every day. <laughs> you will not like me when you come back. The thing that's tricky about fiber is you have to start real slow and build up to it. So I'll tell my, what I'll tell a lot of folks is kind of do like what I do. I get up every morning, I'll have like a bowl of oatmeal. And I may not put a whole third of a cup in here. I may put like a sixth of a cup, you know, starting out. Start real slow because you can always add more. All right, moving right along. I hit on, on this just a little bit about some forms of fiber. Different types of fiber really do different things. It's not that one is necessarily better than the other. The reason why some of these manufacturers are able to get by with seeing some of the things they do, like, oh, our, our product helps lower your cholesterol, like in the oatmeal ads, is because they, have, they tend to have a little bit of more of a water-soluble fiber in there. The insoluble fiber is really a little bit better, like I said, at bulking up your stools. Okay, this is kind of getting back to uh, oh, one more thing I wanted to mention here. I don't know if any of y'all have ever heard of a disease called sprue, but sprue is a, uh, it's an allergy that some people have, unfortunately, to some of the proteins that are in wheat, one of which, for example, in this case, is gluten. And unfortunately, when they eat any kind of wheat products and they have this protein gluten in there or some of these others, it causes an intense inflammation, and that leads to diarrhea and all kinds of problems. All right. Now, why fiber? Well, high fiber diets, interestingly enough, are associated with helping you reduce your risk of heart attack and stroke, and particularly if they have a lot of water soluble uh, fiber in them. And the, uh, the greatest risk reduction here comes from eating uh, foods, for example, like cereals and fruits that have more water soluble fiber. And of course, one thing that's nice here too high fiber diets typically are associated with lower insulin levels. And we're finding that higher and higher insulin levels increase your risk of having a heart attack or stroke. Now, I'm not advocating anybody who's diabetic that they quit taking their insulin. But we, we see a syndrome like what's called syndrome X, where people tend to they have a higher body mass index. Their weight's higher. They're a little heavier than they should be. They may not be a full-blown diabetic. If their triglycerides, for example, are high, and they have higher insulin levels than they should be. And they're kind of in that what we call borderline diabetes range. Those people are at considerably higher risk of having a heart attack or stroke. And the ideal is to not have an insulin level that skyrockets and goes up real high when you eat a meal. One of the ways you can prevent that is by eating foods that have a lot of fiber because the fiber will tend to kind of slow down the absorption, if you will, of the sugar. And so you don't get this big spike and rise in the sugar followed by a rapid spike in the insulin as well. Now, one thing I thought I'd put on here is just a little bit of a, 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 a side note. Have y'all ever heard of what's called postprandial hypoglycemia? Postprandial hypoglycemia, for those that haven't, means that after you eat a meal, your sugar gets low. And it's fascinating. Most people, when they come in, there's, there's, real, there's some really rare illnesses. I, I, I've seen one 15 years out of residency and three years of residency. I've seen one case of this where somebody had, for example, what's called an insulin oma, which I've had people come in. And they'll say, well, hey, there's something wrong with me. My sugar gets real low about, about two hours after eating. I've, I've got something wrong with me. 
tartarus, you know, they didn't tartarus, you're looking for a rare and unusual illness and like these things called insulinomas, which are tumors that make insulin, and they run people's blood sugar down. But no, they, most people don't have that problem. What they have is a problem with what they eat. And the classic description is somebody who goes, for example, to the Waffle House Sunday morning after church, and they get a big old stack of flapjacks, and they pour the syrup on there. It looks like Niagara Falls falling off the side of the pancakes. And then about two hours later, they're going to sell the store because they don't have any sugar. And it's a real simple event, or it's a simple explanation in that the sugar causes such a huge release of insulin from the pancreas that the insulin tends to outlast the sugar. And in essence, once the sugar is all absorbed from the effects of the insulin, then you've got all this insulin floating around, and their sugar's low, so they have to run and go eat and of course, to try and get their sugar back up. How do you prevent that? You, you stay away, like I mentioned earlier, from eating processed, uh, processed foods. And what that means is sugars that don't require any type of digestion. Basically, when you eat processed sugars, or simple sugars as I like to refer to them, as soon as you put them in your mouth and they hit your, your small bowel, they're absorbed instantly. There's no, there's no metabolism that has to occur. And it's almost, it, it's almost the same thing as if you were in the hospital and someone took and put an IV in you and got, gave you a shot of dextrose right in the vein. It's almost that quick. Okay, moving right along here. This is another little interesting study that I was going through and looking at some articles here as I was putting this talk together. But high fiber, high fiber diets help protect diabetes, and I just didn't mention that. And I thought this was fascinating. I mean, I've already told you all about how much fiber ideally you should eat. But it, it, for an example here, in one study, they showed a relative risk reduction of 0.7 with only 8.1 grams of fiber, uh, mainly in the form of cereal, compared to eating less than 3.2 grams per day. I mean, that's kind of pathetic, even 8 grams a day. You know, ideally, and, and everybody's a little bit different in terms of what their needs are. But there's many different wonderful good forms of soluble fiber, which comes in the forms of fruits, vegetables, and beans. All right. Now, this is something that it's really, to me, not really so. I, I looked at several articles on this. In fact, I was even looking at one of the resources that I, that I use in practice every day. It's called Up to Date. And the question is, if I eat a lot of fiber, will it keep me from getting colon cancer? And it's an unsettled issue. Now, there are studies out there that suggest that it may help prevent colon polyps. And colon polyps are what we're always cautious about, and that's what we're screening for with colon cancer, trying to keep people from developing colon cancer. But it's somewhat unsettled. My thought is, eat fiber. It's not going to hurt you. And it may help prevent colon cancer. The problem with these studies are, is that, is they do them, there are a lot of variables that are difficult to account for, like different levels of vitamins. There's different types of fiber, again, the water-soluble versus the insoluble types of fiber. That nobody knows for sure whether or not which type may, may be better at preventing colon cancer or colon polyps. Okay. This is one. This is this is one study I really like. And I've, I've summarized it down to just the very salient points, and that is that with eating fiber, there seems to be a fairly significant survival advantage. In a prospective trial that was done, and they looked at patients age 50 to 71 who ate a high fiber diet. Now, I don't know how much fiber that was. They just said it was a high fiber diet. There was a 22% reduction in all cause all cause mortality, and I kind of like that. So whether it's a stroke, heart attack, cancer, whatever, it didn't matter. They just looked at all causes of death. And there was a 22% 22% reduction. How long the trial went on? I don't know. Yes, ma'am. Well, you said you don't know much on that. What generally is a high fiber diet? Well, generally, when you're getting up to about 20, 25, 30 grams of fiber a day, that's that's kind of your target. That's a good question. All right. Now, what happens if you eat too much fiber? Now, what what happens if we all run out today and go buy us a big old box of fiber and start eating? <laughs> Well, it's not going to be pleasant for you. <laughs> the biggest problem is, and this is, this is one of those things that's tough to get people to, to, to just kind of try and accept it, but flatulence is the medical term. Oops. Flatulence is the medical term we have for gas. And it's unpleasant, but it does occur. Uh, bloating, diarrhea, and cramping. A lot of this is avoidable if you go slow. And by going slow, what I mean is, eat a very small amount, like I was, like I was discussing, for example, with the, uh, with the uh, all brand. <coughs> Starting slow, and maybe over the span of every two or three or four weeks, increasing the amount of fiber that you put in, say, oatmeal or some of the cereal, just a little bit, and it will really help. The answer, though, as I put down here, is to go slow and slowly titrate yourself up. Well, how much? To the point where at least your bowels are working daily. Because that's the problem. 
I had them to come in and say, I have a bowel movement about once every two weeks. I'm like, how is that possible? You know, so, all right. This is another major, major problem that I get is people come in and I'll be kind of taking the history from them and I'll say, well, you know, how often does your, your bowels work? And they say, oh, I go every day. And then I go through their meds and finally kind of get it out of them because they're going and they're taking, you know, a bottle of milk and magnesia once a day. Well, hey, guess what? You're going to have a bowel movement and take a bottle of milk and magnesia. But there's, there's, to me, it's kind of scary to ever recommend laxatives to a patient because a laxative is a band aid. It, it, it's, it's, not a solution to the problem. It's just it's, it's a band-aid approach. It's really not addressing why a patient is having constipation. You know, I get to thinking, well, gee, when I was born, I didn't need to have a laxative. Why do I have to have one as I'm getting older? And a lot of it is when you're young, you know, you can put away a lot more food and you didn't gain the weight. So now we become a little bit more conscious of monitoring calories and we tend to eat a little bit less and less as we get older. And so we don't, a lot of times, get as much fiber in our diet as we should. So people will revert and go and start taking laxatives. Well, laxatives can be a little bit of a danger uh, if you have medical problems. And I know from my, from my standpoint of being a hospitalist, you have to really pay attention to people's kidney function and other problems in order to keep stay out of trouble. And I can't, you know, phosphosoda, when I came out of residency 15 years ago, was used like water for bowel traps for people who were going to go have colonoscopies or very minimum. Phosphosoda has almost been pulled off the market now because the people that have had kidney failure from taking this stuff, even the mild kidney failure. And the danger is when somebody has full blown, a fairly significant kidney failure, and you give them phosphosoda, their serum phosphorus levels skyrocket. And that's why a lot of kidney doctors will not let their patients who are what we call pre dialysis, who have pretty severe kidney failure, but not yet bad enough to be on uh, dialysis, they have them on a very restricted diet where they get very little uh, phosphorus, for example. They don't have them on a lot of potassium. So you have to be careful. Milk and magnesium, for example, is full of magnesium. Now, I'm not saying you can't take a, a dose of milk and magnesium every now and then. But when I get people to come in and say, I'm taking a pint of this stuff every day, we got a problem. And I, that's, I'm trying to get them off of that and figure out what's going on. All right. I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. This is another kind of hot topic that over the last year or two has gotten to be more and more, led to more and more clinical questions and more and more office visits. And that is, what if I take yogurt every day? Is that going to help? And uh, is that going to help my colon? Because a lot of people are concerned about, well, you know, I've got, a lot of people are wondering about how is this going to alter the normal bacteria that are in my colon? And uh, I found this pretty interesting here. I didn't really realize it was this extensive, but it's estimated that there are three to 500 different types of bacteria that live in your colon. Most of your stool, when you have a bowel movement, is bacteria. Mm -hmm. And it's the byproduct of the bacteria there because they're digesting the solid material that comes through your food. And then, so I'll show you in another slide, those bacteria can have a lot of very beneficial effects to you in terms of your health. So the idea came along, well, hey, I'll just go eat the right type of bacteria. Well, isn't that simple? And I'll explain why. Number one, You've got three to five hundred different types, three hundred to five hundred different types of bacteria, and out of this, these, each of these bacteria, they all, they all have their own unique genome, if you will, their own genes, which in this case can amount up to almost two million different genes. And so it's an incredible, it's impossible for a primary care physician to say, well, yeah, sure, if you take this particular type of bacteria, you can have this type of effect and all that. No, it's just no way of knowing. Um, Kind of give you a little bit more of the background on this. Most of the upper GI tract, when you eat something, is sterile. In other words, if you could take a pulse swab like they do your throat, go all the way down into your stomach, you wouldn't grow anything because the stomach and most of the upper small bowel is sterile. It's only when you get down to the area of the small bowel, especially the colon, is where most of the bacteria live. And you say, well, so what? Why are you telling me this at lunch? Well, the reason why is because when people come in the office and they say, well, I'm taking cultured yogurt. Yes, there are a few types of bacteria and yeast that can survive the stomach, but most of the thing, you can literally, and I'm not advocating anybody to do this, you can literally take and, and just eat your food in whole pumps, and it will get digested. And the reason why it will get digested is because when the food hits your stomach, your stomach goes, it really gets after, it just starts turning and grinding, and it secretes an enormous amount of acid. If it didn't, we wouldn't have all the damn acid pills that are out there on the market. But that acid begins to break the food down, and that's real important because it also kills a lot of bacteria. And it's interesting, when you look at hospital medicine, medical literature, 
patients who have been kept on antacid therapy, a lot of doctors will do this. I've done it myself and still do it to a certain degree to prevent stress ulcers in the stomach. Theoretically, those patients are at higher risk of developing infections like pneumonia. So for people who don't take antacid pills, and you're going to, they're going to go take a probiotic, some, some food, for example, that's got bacteria or yeast in it that's supposedly going to help a colony of bacteria or organisms that are in our colon and expect that to survive, it's kind of a long shot. Like I said, there's a few, but most won't. All right. Now, probiotics, too. The intention here, well, the composition of the gut, or the bacteria that are in the gut are influenced by a number of things. You know, the age, the type of diet we eat, and again, the fiber. I brought up the issue about the fiber, the type of fiber you eat, how much fiber you eat. That has a huge effect on the type of bacteria that live in your colon. <coughs> also socioeconomic conditions, and this is the big one right here, antibodies. You know, it's so tempting as a doctor, somebody comes in and says, hey, I got a little sore throat or I got a little earache, you know, can you give me an antibiotic? And you're like, well, it'd be easy just to go ahead and write a prescription and give it to them. I mean, that's the easy thing to do. But there's a lot of consequences to that, and I'm going to talk about the consequences of that in the last few slides of this talk. And I, I think for some of y'all, it'll be a real eye opener. But antibiotics do just what they say. They're anti-life. They kill things. They kill bacteria. All right. We go right on here. Now, I also was going to just mention here, probiotics are usually supplements comprised with bacteria or yeast. The thing that was interesting about this as I was getting this talk put together was the same type of bacteria, for example. Let's take, some, take one like lactobacillus. This, study was, this, this article was talking about how the same lactobacillus, the exact same species, made by one manufacturer, put in one type of pill or one type of product compared to another manufacturer, you end up getting totally unexpected results where no one product will work, the other one won't. It's the exact same bacteria. So I'm, I'm, a little bit, I'm a little bit guarded in recommending any of these probiotic things right now. Now, a year from now, five years, ten years from now, probiotics may be a huge part of medicine, and there's a huge growing interest in these things because there are some very interesting and exciting things that they're seeing with them. Uh, this, this slide, for example, right here, probiotics, what would you take them for? I mean, other than just taking them just to be taken, and, and, and quite honestly, to waste money on it, there are some cases where it will help things like inflammatory bowel disease, and this is a big deal. Uh, also, alteration of the, uh, of the immune system. Now, I found this pretty interesting. In an animal, an animal model, they found that when they gave some of these animals a probiotic, it can actually decrease joint inflammation. Now, again, I'm not recommending that at all. That's just, that's just in, in some laboratory and some research study. Irritable bowel syndrome is another one where they're starting to find a lot of benefit for probiotics. But again, I think, to me, this is something that needs to be under the, done under the guidance of the doctor. Okay, then there is what they call prebiotics, not probiotics. Probiotics are the bacteria we're actually consuming them. Prebiotics are foods that you actually eat, they're non-digestible foods, fiber, that when you take them, they become, they're fermented and they're, they're consumed by bacteria that already live in the colon. And so what you're trying to do is take a type of food and selectively improve the growth of the so-called good bacteria that live in your colon. And you'll probably hear more about these as time goes on, especially in the paper and magazine articles and news stories on TV. One of the best examples of prebiotics is especially when you're born and if children are breastfed, there's a lot of antibodies, an, an, antibodies uh, and a lot of time, different types of foods and nutrients that are in a mother's breast milk that actually help colonize and set up the right type of bacteria in an infant's colon. Also, there's a variety of foods that we can eat now as adults, for example, like what I have mentioned or listed here, like wheat, onions, and other things, bananas, that actually can help improve the survival of the so-called good bacteria in the colon. Okay, colon cancer. I thought we'd just kind of talk on this. One thing I try real hard to do when people come in is I try not and, and, and kind of miss the target. In other words, I try and keep an eye on the forest and not just get focused on the tree here. And I try and get people that, that will encourage them to go get their colonoscopies done and get, get screened for colon cancer. The reason for this is colon cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death here, and it's the third most common type of cancer out there. And the nice thing about it is most colon cancers are due to colon polyps, which if they're caught early, the colon polyps can be snared and eradicated, and it's not a big not near as big a deal as it would be to have to go in and go general, general anesthesia and be put to sleep and be cut open. All right, this is some guidelines. These are, the, these are the guidelines that are put out by what they call the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. 
And basically, just as a reminder, for folks who are the age 50 to 75, they found that there, there is what they call an A recommendation for this. And what that means is, for the most part, people who go get a colonoscopy in this age bracket tend to have, there's, there's a survival advantage to doing that. As opposed to the fact is that as we get older, generally in the 70, like 76 to 85 range, I kind of start pushing back for a little bit, and I leave it up to the patients to whether or not they want to go do that. Certainly people, when they get to the age of 85 and older, you know, to take someone over to, a, to a, like I said, GI suite, start trying to sedate them, put them through a colonoscopy, you know, you worry about, am I going to cause that patient to have a heart attack or stroke, and then if I find something, are they up to the challenge of me putting them through a major operation or taking chemotherapy? So that's why the benefit is we tend to get a little bit older, tends to start to wane. And, it, and that's why for folks who are at the age of 50 to 75 range, that tends to be the sweet spot where it's the best time to get screened for colon cancer. Okay, risk factors for colon cancer. A lot of this is pretty self-explanatory. But again, constipation. When I'm, you know, I'm going back to the beginning of this talk, when somebody comes in there complaining of constipation, I kind of I like to get a good history from them. You know, how old are they, for example? Are they in the right age group for them to be screened? Or even if they're younger than, say, the age of 50, did their parents have a brother or sister had colon cancer? I had a lady that came to me, it was pretty interesting. She was in her late 20s. She had colon cancer. She was born with what they call familial adenomatous polyposis, where when they took her colon out, it was just covered with polyps everywhere. And all those polyps have a high potential of turning into colon cancer. So she did, they went ahead and took her entire colon out and pushed her, her small bowel to prevent recurrences elsewhere. But the odd thing about it was, this is a, it's a genetic problem that she has. It predisposes her to tumors elsewhere in the body, like in the bones and a number of other areas. Okay, lastly, I get asked a lot about things like this today, and I, rightfully, people don't get too excited about going over and undergoing a colonoscopy. And I haven't had one yet, I'm not quite, I'm not 50 yet, but <laughs> I'm not anxious to go have this done either, and I understand people's reluctance. So, people, people will say, well, patients will ask, well, what about if I go and I get this, this CAT scan done, this virtual colonoscopy? And this is okay, but the problem with it, this, what people have got to remember is number one, it involves a lot of radiation from a CAT scan. Or something like colonoscopy does not involve any radiation. And the other thing is, there's nothing like looking directly in there. Now, in time, CAT scan or MRI, some of these other modalities may get good enough that they're able to detect this. But these studies, like CT scans, still have a pretty, a pretty poor ability to detect small polyps, especially anything like less than, say, a centimeter. That's about a half an inch. And, you know, the nice thing about colonoscopy is that when you're in there and you see something that size, you can usually get those out pretty easy. Alright, again, colon cancer, things to do, high fiber diets may help, but avoiding red meat, of course, I like to have a piece of beef every now and then as well. Another curious thing here too, that I'm starting to see a few of the GI doctors doing, is putting patients on aspirin, or at least offering them that option, to take aspirin to prevent colon cancer. And that's only, it's only in a certain subpopulation where people are at considerably higher risk. But it's interesting to see aspirin, or an NSAID, if you will, used to prevent colon cancer. Now, I'm not advocating that for the group here at large, because taking NSAIDs, as you know, is, is, it can be dangerous. It can cause kidney failure, run your blood pressure up. It can cause stomach ulcers. There's a number of ill side effects. But it's interesting to see that being done. We, you know, we think about taking an aspirin to prevent a heart attack or stroke. Okay. This, to me, is probably for me, one of the most interesting parts of this whole talk. And I'll explain why here in just a minute. But it's diarrhea. And, uh, you know, I think the biggest mistake, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, most, most cases of diarrhea in this day and time are self-limited. A lot of times they're due to viral illnesses. But starting out, we don't always know that. Now, when I see somebody comes in the clinic or in the hospital, for example, and they're admitted for diarrhea, I'm kind of, you know, naturally, I'm not too concerned about a virus. I mean, it may be that, it may be that simple. But I'm on a hunt mission, and I'm trying to make sure I don't miss something that can prove to be fatal. And I'm going to talk to you exactly about what I'm talking about here in just a second. Um, the most important thing, though, when somebody comes in with diarrhea, the question is, of course, is have they had the appropriate age-adjusted risk colon cancer screening studies done, like a colonoscopy? I looked at their medicines again. You remember I talked to you about the pint of, 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 of milk and magnesia today? Look for things like that. I like to look at your drugs. For example, if they're a diabetic, where they put on a new drug like glucophage. Now, I use glucophage like water in the right population of diabetics. But one of the side effects of glucophage, of course, is, is diarrhea and antibiotics. And this is a real big problem right here. Let me show you why. Have any of y'all heard of this illness? It's called, we call it C. diff for short, Clostridium difficile colitis. Has anyone heard of that? All right. Somebody in the room may have been unfortunate to have had this. Most of the time, it's a very easily, very treatable illness. 
Sometimes it's not. Sometimes this is a fatal problem. And the way that most people get this is when they're on antibiotics. You say, well, why is that? Well, what happens is C. difficile is a type of bacteria that lives in your colon. It's there. We've all got it in our colon. The problem is when you go to the doctor or you get on an antibiotic, you end up killing off all the so-called good bacteria. When you're trying to kill off the bad bacteria that may be causing you to have a sore throat or pneumonia or wherever else. But you also end up killing off, a lot of times, a lot of the good bacteria. Most of the time, your body will compensate and it will recover. And the, and the population of bacteria, that, the good bacteria that was killed off in the colon, will come back. It will repopulate. And once in a while, this, the C. diff or Clostridium difficile bacteria will get out of hand and it will take over the colon. And that's bad because C. diff will begin making a toxin that causes diarrhea. And it basically poisons the colon. You can't absorb water. It basically just strips all the normal <coughs> lining off the inside of the colon. The biggest mistake I've seen is in patients, for example, who get, get put on antibiotics. When I was a hospitalist for eight years, I saw this. I saw a number of cases. This patient gets put on an antibiotic. They get diarrhea. They don't associate that the diarrhea came from the, from the antibiotic. Or maybe they think it was a, just an adverse effect of the antibiotic. And certainly an, antibiotics can do that without causing C. diff, C -diff cell collapse. But they get out there, and the next thing they do, they go down to the drugstore, and they get this, they get some anti-motility drug, in other words, something to treat their diarrhea with. So they shut down the motility of the colon, and they're trying to stop the diarrhea. Well, that only inflames. That's like throwing gas on the fire when it comes to C. diff, and it gets it going. I had a little man who did this very thing. He was about 80 years of age. The sad thing about it was everybody in his family got C. diff. He decided he was going to tough it out. Well, by the time he got to the hospital, he had what they call toxic megacolon. And that's where the colon basically is dead and it's become very dilated. And at that point, basically, by the time I got him to the hospital, his colon basically had died and put him on all kinds of antibiotics to try and treat the C. diff. Unfortunately, it didn't work out for him and he ended up passing away. And so I tell patients all the time, hey, look, we're going to put you on an antibiotic. If you go home and you develop any diarrhea, you, you know, I want you back up here or you come to the emergency room because. C. diff can be explosive at its onset of its presentation. And I'm not telling you, I'm not bringing this up to y'all to scare anybody, but I think it's important to realize that when you go to your doctor and you're put on an antibiotic, you don't want to blow diarrhea off. You don't want to minimize that. If, if, if it's, if, especially if it's a pretty vigorous diarrhea, it's worth calling your doctor and saying, hey, I've got this diarrhea. They may stop the antibiotic if they can, or, or they may want to uh, try and get some stool studies. C. diff is pretty yeah. easy to diagnose. It just requires some stool studies to look for the toxin to see if it's there. And if it's there, the next step, of course, is to get somebody on antibiotics. All right. We've talked a little bit about this, that C. diff is a bad bacteria that tends to overgrow. Okay. So, again, you don't have to be on antibiotics to get C. diff. And, I've, and then this, this little man that I presented to you that ended up passing away, and everybody in his family got diarrhea from C. diff because they were all living close together probably weren't having as good a hygiene as they thought they were or should have, and then exposing one another to this. All right. So in conclusion, this is the last slide. In terms of kind of good colon health, I think a good high fiber diet is always healthy and a good thing to do. It's just you've got to go slow with the fiber. And if you're at the right age group trying to get yourself screened for colon cancer, I've got an uncle, for example. He decided he wasn't going to go have his colonoscopy. Finally, one day, started passing a little blood from his rectum. He went in there, and they found this massive polyp. Fortunately, it turned, well, unfortunately, it, was, it, turned, it turned out it was malignant. And they weren't able to, it was so large, they weren't able to get it out through the colonoscope. But he went to surgery, had to spread anywhere, and they got it out. And you know, I, I think about that. You know, so none of us are immune to this, this, this cancer thing. But I think it's always worth talking to your doctor about making sure you have the appropriate cancer screening. And then, of course, constipation and diarrhea. You know, if, if they persist and there are problems, you shouldn't live with constipation and you shouldn't live with diarrhea. You need that, those are important medical problems to talk to your doctor about. And then I think the exciting thing is going to be to see what happens in the future over the next few years with the prebiotics and the probiotics as well. So, with that said, I'm done and I appreciate y'all's attention. <laughs>